Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's Trending Treasury, which is our weekly webcast from Arling Close. This week, I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Iris Innovision, and we're going to be talking about IFRS 16 transition and how we can learn things from the experience that the private sector had during their transition to the new standard. Um, many of the uh, many of our listeners and our attendees will, will be well aware that IFRS 16 is the new leasing standard. So we'll be looking at sort of how um, the private sector transition, which happened you know, a good few years ago now, what their experience was and how how we can learn from it and what this what some of the the challenges were what was perhaps not as challenging and and also you know some of the benefits maybe of, of the new standard and, and, and how the private sector have found th those benefits um so today I'm, I'm very pleased to be joined by uh by Maeve and Richard um how are you, how are you both um today are you uh are you are you feel it did, did, um I, have, I presume this uh, at least Richard was uh was pleased with the football last night <laughs> <laughs> good morning yes um very pleased about the football last night um and uh, yeah looking forward to a, a good game on saturday as well sunday actually isn't it <laughs> yeah what match are you watching on saturday i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well brilliant well let, let's let's crack on straight away so i mean just as a way of of, of background for, for our attendees i've mentioned that ifs 16 is the new leasing standard but what what it actually is? What are the, actually the major changes we're looking at, and and what are the benefits that we're that the that the new standard is hoping to bring? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to give yourself a quick introduction, Maeve? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I'm Maeve O'Connell. I have been with Innovision since uh, well for five years now. Uh, we started. Uh, developing a system for IFRS 16 and FASB ASE 842, which is the US version of the same standard uh, five years ago. So uh, Richard and I were uh, heavily involved in selling to the corporate sector uh, from that time. I am an accountant myself and I am the lead. I take the lead in the development of the product itself. Thanks, Maeve. Uh, Richard Hunsley here. I, I joined Iris Innovision back in 2016, around about the same time as Maeve, and uh, I'm the sales lead for uh, IFRS 16 product. Um, and since then, since 2016, uh, I've been involved in 60 or 70 client IFRS 16 projects, uh, along with Maeve. Uh, we've worked very closely together on these. And that's with organisations such as Baxter's, John Lewis, CDF, sort of major um, UK uh, organizations and then on top of that along with Maeve uh, we between the two of us we've probably had about four or five hundred separate discussions with organizations over the last four or five years on their IFRS 16 projects so uh, we've built up quite a bit of practical experience um, uh, on the standard and, and the sort of challenges that, that organizations have gone through uh, implementing the standard which hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share with you uh, on the on the call this morning so, um, Great. so to go back to the question, yeah, yes. <laughs> a very good introduction. Thanks very much. <laughs> to go back to the question, um, yeah. so what what actually is IFRS 16, and yeah. um, what are the benefits of adopting the standard? Yeah, the, the the biggest change is your operating leases that you have been accounting under IS 17 off balance sheet will now appear on balance sheet. You will have to recognise. Uh, a, a right of use asset and a lease liability, similar to what you do today for your finance leases. Uh, with that, there is a lot of work that needs to happen in terms of defining whether it is a lease to begin with. And it's all about whether you control the use of the asset uh, for a period of time for an identified asset. So they, that's the kind of criteria in order to determine whether there is a lease or not. Um, the biggest change that you'll see is currently under IS 17, you will have a lease expense appearing as part of the, um, your EBITDA uh, operating lease expenses, or operating expenses. Uh, that's not going to change, so you're going to have uh, instead a depreciation charge and an interest charge. That does affect your KPIs and uh, the thing you have to remember is you have a nice straight line charge now for your lease expense in the P&L for your operating leases, and that's going to change to uh, whereby you're going to have a heavier charge at the start of a, a lease and it reduces over time because although your depreciation is most likely going to be straight line, uh, the interest element of that operating lease charge going forward um, is 
going to be heavier at the start of release and reduces over time. So that's, uh, you know, it does affect uh, how you look at your income statement. Uh, from a balance sheet perspective, obviously you're going to increase both your uh, assets and your liabilities because you're going to have more on balance sheet now around your right of use assets and your lease liabilities. Um, that will affect all of your uh, um, key performance indicators. Again, anything that you're relying on, anything that's calculated, looking at your assets and liabilities will be changed. Um, the big thing that you have to do is when you're identifying your leases, you have to look at any low value leases. Um, the standard uh, refers to uh, a value of $5,000 for a separately identifiable asset that's capable of being uh, operating independently, you know, so it, it has to be a fully functioning asset. It excludes things like cars and things like that. But I, uh, I know that the local authorities will have to set their own limit. Uh, can't necessarily rely on that $5,000. The $5,000 doesn't actually appear in the standard itself. It's in the kind of supplementary information that's referred to. Uh, it is something that people um, do you struggle with? So uh, it's things like if you have um, uh, a whole, you know, like say 200 laptops, each of those laptops will be under, uh, they would be considered as a, a, a low value item. If you're bundling them all up in one lease, you can consider that whole lease to be low value. Um, there's other things like uh, the IBOR rate, so that's the incremental borrowing rate. Now I know that from a local authority perspective, you're probably going to use the, the rates uh, for your local authority, but um, if there is, uh, if you do know what the implicit rate is in the lease, you should use that. If not, you would have to use uh, the IBOR, the equivalent from the local authority. Uh, from a corporate perspective, that's been a very, very difficult thing to determine, the IBRs, and it is the thing that has attracted a lot of scrutiny from the auditors. So um, that is definitely something to not underestimate the amount of effort there in, in arriving at that. Um, other things that you have to decide uh, if you you if you can uh, split out the non-lease components from the lease components. So things like maintenance that you get charged along with the, the actual lease element of vehicles is quite a common thing. Uh, the lessors may or may not give you that information. Uh, normally you will get a charge that is bundled and I uh, I worked for lessors for years. I was on that side where uh, it was favourable to bundle charges and make it as um, difficult as possible for the client to determine what sort of a margin you were charging on everything, what sort of a rate you were charging. So uh, you may find that if you're looking to your lessors to give you additional information to help you split out the non-lease components, they may not be very willing to do that and that makes the whole uh, process quite onerous. So we have found a lot of clients have just found it too difficult in certain circumstances. Uh, the importance of uh, being able to split it out is you would, may not want to capitalise everything. If you can't split out the charge, you're actually capitalising more on your balance sheet. Um, if you can, you would treat that non lease component element, just like your lease expense, it's an operating uh, charge that will be part of your EBITDA as opposed to capitalizing it and having it as uh, interest and depreciation. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot that's changing, you know, is, there, is, is, the, is, the, simple, is the simple is, part of it. I mean, yes. thinking about the, the transition itself, because yeah. uh, we went through you know, the transition in the private sector a number of years ago, this is now you know, a very live issue after a number of delays for, for local authorities. What are the sorts of things that local authorities are going to need to get? What, what ducks are they going to need to get in a line in order yeah. to undertake the transition? Because you know, the, the, the date is the date feels like it's far away, but you know, already they're going to have to start thinking about putting numbers in the um, in, in the accounts for, next, for this year saying, you know, about you know, the impact on the transition. So what are the things that, that they'll actually, they'll need to get in place yeah. for a successful transition? Yeah, uh, getting that data together in the first instance is so key. Um, 
uh, Richard will tell you how often we've had clients come to us and say, oh, well, I have, you know, uh, 500 leases or 1,000 leases, and you can be sure within six months they've actually doubled the amount of leases that they actually thought they had. Um, it, it is a long process currently because uh, charges are, you know, leases can be written uh, across any part of, of the uh, local authority. Um, you, won't, you won't even know that leases have been written because it's just seen as a constant charge into the income statement on a monthly basis. No one questions it because it doesn't change, you know, um, and gathering that information in the very first instance is very, very key. Trying to set up um, cross functional groups to actually make sure that everybody throughout the business is involved in actually doing that collation of data. It can't be left to just the finance department because it's too it's it's too onerous. It really is that exercise. Uh, give yourself plenty of time to get that data in. That seems to be the biggest thing that people have. Um, then you have lots of decisions to make. There are decisions around: uh, Are you reasonably certain to extend that lease? Are you reasonably certain to terminate that lease early? These are decisions you have to make about the the term of the lease, and that directly impacts what you're capitalising on your balance sheet. So. Uh, give yourself the time to make those decisions. Um, you can't make those decisions lightly. One key thing that we've come across with clients um, is in determining um, whether to extend or terminate early. Be aware that your uh, auditors will absolutely look at what has happened historically as to whether you have on uh, previously uh, always terminated early you know, when the break clause happened or whether you've tended to actually extend and extend and extend. They will actually test that. So you have to back up with evidence as to why you have made that assessment one way or the other. Um, the, uh, you also need to be sure the other thing that has caught uh, some of our clients out is um, they have what they call uh, held over leases. So they've actually reached the end of the lease contract and they haven't, they're in negotiations around the new contract, but they haven't actually agreed the, that contract, it's, it's not actually agreed. Um, you would think in that situation that you would apply your reason be certain to extend because you, you, you're in negotiations, but you have to be very careful about the T's and C's there to make sure that if um, there are no enforceable rights or obligations during that, uh, period of negotiation. So one lease has ended, but actually you don't have any rights over that asset and the lessor is the one in control, then it isn't actually a, a lease. You know, it's all about the right to control the asset. So be very careful about the definitions um, and the assumptions you make. You have to back these things up. We have seen time and time again where the auditors have come in and said, no, actually, uh, you didn't have any enforceable rights during that period. You have to actually treat that as an expense to your PL. And when you negotiate the contract, then you put it back up in your balance sheet. So these are all small little nuances that aren't explicit in the in the standard, but from experience with the, you know, the uh, our clients and how the auditors have, have fed back. Um, it is quite important to, to take note of these things. Um, the other thing I would say when you're preparing for a transition is uh, definitely trying to get as much information around the low value leases. Now, if leases are going to be terminating um, after uh, the go live date, uh, or sorry, just before the go live date, you don't need to be looking at those leases unless, of course, you are renegotiating extensions, etc. And then you would need to start considering them. But in the first instance, they are not, you know, you don't need to put them up uh, when you actually um, start um, on the 1st of April 2022. So um, uh, another thing is um, for us, it was trying to put some controls in place because currently the information is quite uh, you know, it's spread across the whole organization, all of the leases. You need to have some process in place as to how are you going to centralize the uh, approval of the leases going forward, the recognition of the leases, who's going to make the decisions internally, what decisions are you going to make uh, as a group, as a, an authority around what the low value is, uh, what that low value hurdle rate is, um, short term, 
at least says, you know, um, looking again as to whether you, you tend to extend on short term leases, i.e. leases that are less than 12 months, do you continuously um, extend them? So actually they're not really short term leases. Um, making sure that uh, there is some sort of process whereby you can collate that information on a monthly basis. It's not just a one off exercise of getting all of your leases in one exercise and, and start capitalising them. You have to have something in place for the ongoing accounting of those leases uh, and applying uh, the same same rigour that you are applying when looking at the uh, leases at transition around whether it's a lease or not. Um, that's really, really important. Time is 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 not on your side, I would say. So, you know, the sooner you can get onto this, the better. Just just to um, just to add to that, um, I think many organisations are experienced over the last few years underestimate uh, both the complexity of transitioning to IFRS 16 and, and, and connected with that, the time that it takes. And we all know that um, people working in the finance department are always very busy. They've got a numerous challenges on the go. And the consequence of that is, is that um, IFRS 16 has always been put on the back burner and approached very much at the last minute. And what we've seen is, is that can often mean that um, the process isn't started off in, in the best practice. I think that yeah, the, the standard can be complex and uh, it can also be vague in some areas as well. So as you're familiarising yourself with IFRS 16, there are also sort of some gaps in, in the way that the, 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 uh, tra the um, it, it's articulated. So it does take time uh, to establish a solid policy. So do, please do bear that in mind. Give, you, give yourselves plenty of time, although there are temptations to leave it, to put it on the back burner. Um, I think it's also very difficult, as Maeve, Maeve indicated, identifying uh, the leases within an organisation. We we know from our from our previous experience that the lease contracts could be in cupboards. They could be in cupboards that people have forgotten about. They could be in spreadsheets. And once you start the process of identifying those leases within organisations, and from the initial discussions I've had with public sector organisations, these are the same challenges that that uh, that they faced in the corporate sector. They they, they are being faced by the um, by the public sector. Uh, so please do bear that in mind. That that process of going throughout the organisation, identifying those leases, does take time, uh, because you know within organisations. Leasing is, has often been ad hoc and there's not been a central uh, process around that. So you'll have people in different areas doing different things. So going out and getting cooperation from um, different people within the organisation isn't always easy. There's, there's a bit of resistance. Uh, oh, why do I have to do this? So, you know, it, do, it does take time. So please do bear that in mind. Um, and also this idea of what is a lease and what isn't a lease, that, that can often take time as you develop a process internally to work out what is going to be impacted and what isn't. And then once you have identified your contracts, you've, you've, you've found them in a cupboard, you've found them in a spreadsheet, you've determined that this is something impacted under the standard. It's about sort of extracting from that contract all the relevant data points that you need to do your IFRS 16 accounting. And, and this all takes time. Um, so, so please do uh, give yourselves plenty of time for that as you as you go through the exercise. One thing we know and, and Maeve will, 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 will perhaps elaborate on this is that we've experienced many projects where um, the organisations feel they've gone through this process with data collection. So they, they think that they've they've gone through, they, they've, they've um, uh, gone through this data collection exercise. They've got these data points from their contracts and they think, great, we're, we're ready to go for IFRS 16. But we have experienced on, on quite a few occasions that once that data collection process has started and, and in, in, then in their view completed, uh, once they get to the point where they really start to try to do the accounting for it, there are often gaps in that data, um, which results in the requirement to go out and almost do that data collection process again. So we do recommend that you get a real solid process in place for that initial data collection, because first of all, um, getting the buy-in from other from other areas of your organisation to start going through that data gathering again and giving you that data is is quite quite difficult because 
you know people in the organization might not be that cooperative in the first place so please do uh, do, do your earnest to to get that initial data collection phase um, sorted and that's all around understanding your contracts understanding the data points needed um, on top of that i think it's helpful to really standardize within your organization uh, what those data points are um, you know, on in close, I think we'll be able to help you with that in in getting a standardized um, template, perhaps distribute that throughout the organization and then at least people know what data points they need to gather for the finance people. Um, and also, um, I think it's quite important to cooperate or, or real estate the benefits of IFRS 16 to the rest of the organization to get their buy in people that manage the land and the properties and, and the others that might manage equipment and, and vehicles. Try and get their buy in early on by illustrating some of the benefits of IFRS 16. Um, some of you may be in the office or at home thinking, oh, this IFRS 16 is a bit of a nightmare. And, and you know, just to reassure you, you're not alone. Uh, that, that's our experience with, with the uh, <laughs> with, with businesses. I think any, everybody universally feels that it's uh, uh, something that is is uh, time consuming and, and not appreciated. But but actually, there are some real benefits to adopting the standard. This this idea that at the moment contracts might be in cupboards. And as a consequence of that, you know, it might be a vehicle lease, for example, that, that sort of has run its three year course and you're paying payments or it might be a vehicle that's been returned and it's been overlooked and you all of a sudden getting very bad value for that lease. But a, but a benefit of IFRS 16 and, and can be communicated to the wider organisation is that once you um, centralise this data, um, you know, you, you can sort of manage these contracts better, manage these vehicles better, and all of a sudden you're getting much better value from your leasing activity. And if you cooperate this to the organization, um, you know, you, you, you can get more buy-in. And um, so, you know, reach out early to the to different people in the organization, uh, land property vehicles, get their buy-in and standardize that data collection process with them so you don't have to go through that process uh, a second or third time even. Yeah, we've had um we've had a couple of um we've had a couple of uh, questions from um from the uh, from from our listeners. So I thought this would be a good time just to to jump in with those questions before we uh, before we go on to sort of some of the specific lessons learned. Um, first of all, I mean, with um there's, we've had a question around you know, what's the what discretion have we got around that five thousand uh, dollars de minimis level? I mean, for a local authority, obviously they have things like their capital. Um, they have their capital de minimis that they usually use, but is there a is is there a, quite a high level of de, um, of discretion? Maeve, I know you know you, you mentioned that that number wasn't actually in the standard; it's in in the guidance no. notes around it. No, but most of the auditors, being honest, do kind of work towards that same value or you know a GBP equivalent of, of it. Um, but a lot of discussions then come down to materiality. Now, materiality and that value don't necessarily go hand in hand. So there's a um, it is a value. It has it's really about um, they give the example in the standard saying a car would not be seen as a, a low value asset, even if it was five thousand dollars, it would not be seen. And the whole point of it is um, to save you the effort in actually having to account for a lot of, of assets, kind of IT assets, that sort of thing. So it's about really uh, applying common sense to it too, just saying, you know, it really is to save you the bother of looking at all of your office type equi equipment that, you know, um, that you have a lot of, it's low value, and they don't want you to go mm. to the bother of. That's really the intent of it. It uh, feels to me a bit like it's maybe, if you'd capitalise it, if you bought it yourself, yeah, it's yeah. probably it's probably covered by IFRS 16. Yeah, if you wouldn't capitalise it, if you bought it yourself, if you just expense it, it yeah. probably isn't covered by that. That's, I mean, that that's what it feels like to me. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really good rule of thumb, and, and it's sort of um, you you find that the the auditors uh, um, are can be open to discussion on this, but you do find it's not. Uh, most of our clients, I would say, have stuck to that value. They might have used five thousand pounds instead of five thousand dollars and agreed to that with the auditors up front. So whatever that value is, it's really important to have a discussion with your auditors. So any of your decision points early on, 
have that discussion to just sound out with your auditors how favorable they are or not because what you don't want to do is to make an assumption that it is okay whatever value you've come up with and then get to the audit and then they they change their mind completely and you've got a whole heap of work to redo um we haven't come across that usually around the value but we have had discussions where they've said don't mix materiality and that five thousand mm. dollar uh don't mix the two, so they're very clear. And I think the point there that you made, Stephen, is a very good rule of thumb. You know, how would you treat this asset under IS seventeen? You know, you know, would you would you just uh, well, actually uh, would you capitalise it or not capitalise it under normal PPE? Yeah. I yeah. mean, we've we've had two other questions. I mean, one is um is is a question that just asking, do all contracts that are active as that transition need to be reviewed to determine if they've got a right of use asset, or do we not have to revisit previous contracts? I'll I'll happily quickly answer that one. Um, under the the the, the current uh, CIPFA code, what you'll be required to do is is look at all of your current um all of your current operating leases to see if they they have a they include a right of use asset. Um. Also, if, but, but on transition specifically, you're not required to find and to if you haven't, if it didn't count as an operating lease previously, you don't need to worry about it. However, and this is a big however, they have also made it clear that if you didn't count it as an operating lease by mistake, if it wasn't, if you did that incorrectly, then you do need to bring it on as uh, so you, it, you can't you can't rely on on previous, and I think that 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 comes to nicely points out Richard's point, which is you know, all of these leases that are you know in cupboards or in spreadsheets, those things that should have been counted as a lease previously that are perhaps haven't been need to be brought on for this. So it's a good um, um actually which leads us on to um, Anthony's question, which is what are the benefits? I think actually one of the big benefits of Ivor 16 is cleaning up. A lot of these things and cleaning up a lot of the things. I mean, I don't know if that's um, if that's your your experience, Richard and Maeve, that you know the yeah. there's, there's sort of a an administrative benefit of, of yeah. Of well, well, it was very funny because of course everybody has to state what the impact is, you know, in the prior year, what the impact is going to be of converting to IFRS 16, and the number of um, operating these statements that had clearly been very, very wrong in previous years. It was quite dramatic. So making sure that you get that prior year operating lease uh, note correct is really important because that you're you're using that to sort of um, build on to say I'm going to take that figure and I'm going to convert it now to be something that's capitalized in the balance sheet and it was really quite dramatic how different uh, the reporting was year on year just before transition around that operating lease note uh, and people had absolutely underestimated it. The benefit of consolidating all of the information, having control over these leases is you can actually end up with better buying power. Now, uh, Innovision as an organisation, we actually do lease consultancy. And uh, so we do negotiate on the T's and C's and uh, all of that for on contracts for, for clients. And uh, we could see how, you know, when you've got everything collated in one place, you can see how bad you've done in negotiating uh, different types of leases because when you can see how many leases you have with the same lessor for the same sort of assets for the same term but completely different rates because different people have negotiated it it gives you much better buying power and it makes you a bit more savvy when it comes to renegotiating lease terms and managing the leases and managing that expenditure so uh, we've definitely seen um, how much uh more kind of buying power our clients have had as a result of this exercise yes yeah, yeah and, a, and a common experience i think we we see around organizations preparing for ifrs 16 is that they have leases that they weren't aware of that had been forgotten about and but quite often they're still paying for it and, and they might not have the asset anymore so you know things are overlooked and um, you know, you're getting very bad value as an organisation for your leasing activity, if that is the case. Uh, you know, we've got numerous examples where <clears throat> the organisation doesn't have access to the assets anymore, but they're still paying for it. Um, you know, if you're going through this collation period of, um, you know, identifying all these lease contracts, centralising them all, um, 
you know, and, and having potentially a system that gives you notifications when these lease contracts are coming up for renewal, these won't be overlooked <clears throat> and you uh, you won't be sort of paying for things that you, you don't have access to anymore. I think that's one major point, sa saving your, your, your organization's money. And then secondly, having, having people within the organization to take a more responsibility centrally for uh, the leasing activity, as, as maybe we're talking about, if you have one person or perhaps one person uh, that is leading it or becoming a little bit more expert in negotiating your leases um, rather than people ad hoc throughout the organization doing it <clears throat> individually. Um, you know, it makes sense that uh, all that's collective and you get much more value. Um, so, you know, it's hard work, but but if you do it properly, there are certainly benefits um, to, to adopting I416. Great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground today which has been brilliant and i think i certainly feel that we've uh, we've got a good idea of, of some of the pitfalls that the uh, the private sector perhaps uh, have, have had experiences of and um where where we can sort of learn from that especially around i think the the point that you've the two points that really have have come out for me are you know, making sure you give yourself plenty of time but also that um that idea that that i think you've both really raised which is that it's not as uh, it, it's not about just finance applying a new reporting standard you know, it's it's something that you know, all of the organization really needs to be part of i mean the the thing that really i think jumped out at me from that i hadn't really considered was some of the internal politics you're going to have to manage around for example lease lives oh yeah well we're definitely going to get rid of that lease next year well, the auditors turned around and said, well, you've said that every year for the last 10 years and you've still got it. So I think some of those sorts of internal negotiations, it feels to me like are very important for um, for clients to consider. So, again, reinforcing your point that we need uh, to make sure we give ourselves plenty of time uh, for the transition period. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Stephen, I, I think, you know, <clears throat> as an organisation, head of finance perhaps might think, oh, it, bit of compliance can't be that too diff can't be that difficult and then that's sort of potentially delegated to a financial accountant uh, to do along with lots of other activities within the organization uh, so you've got i for 16 plus other core core uh, core functional activities and you know it's a good idea to get in early actually with with um, you know people in very senior positions that might be making decisions on allocating resource to the exercise that you know it, it is actually a lot more complicated than we think initially think because of all of these reasons therefore can we have somebody dedicated to i for a 16 for a certain period uh, to focus on the activity and the net result of that is that you'll have a not only a better transition but a better process moving forward um, you know whether that's a better leasing policy whether that's a better uh, businesses and usual policy for uh, automating changes to leases uh, because of course you know if if an accountant along with lots of other responsibilities is having to tackle i for 16 what we know is i for 16 usually gets put on the back burner and and then and again it comes around to this challenge of, of time again so you know as well as giving yourself plenty of time have discussions with with heads of finance perhaps just indicating some of these challenges ahead so you get a bit more resource allocated to it great well, we've we've actually gone over time because there's been such good uh, good good um good content today. So so sorry if, if any of you have had to uh, had to hang on, but I think it's been worth it. It's been a great so um, a great session. So thank you very much to um to Richard and May. We'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, next week um we'll be talking to Carl Adams from ICD and my colleague Stuart will be uh, grilling him on um on how technology is is affecting treasury management and how technology can be used to improve the uh, improve the functions of treasury and and where do we think that treasury is um, going to go with regards to technology in over the next couple of years so thank you all very much everybody for for joining us i hope you do join us next week on for next week's webcast so i'll just say thank you again to maven richard for a really interesting session and uh, see you all again next week thank you thank you all the best bye, bye.